Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. How many theologians do I have in the room today? Theologians. All right, good. We're getting this, right? If you've ever read your Bible, you are a theologian. The word theology is the word theos, meaning God, and ology, meaning logos, meaning the word, so God's word. Anytime you ever study or read God's word, you're doing theology. All right, want to point that out there. Today's topic is not a fun one, but I believe that it needs to be talked about. I don't think we talk about it enough, and we don't understand it. It's the doctrine on death. Death. I hope to not make this too morbid. I hope to not make this too uncomfortable. Because not too many people like discussing this topic. Right? And, and, and I don't know why. Like, a lot of people have a problem doing estate planning. If you don't have an estate plan, like, please sit down with your family and plan out what your wishes are for your life what your wishes are for your death, like, take the initiative, see what kind of insurances you have and what you want done and those sort of things. But here's a startling statistic, right? Because we understand that death affects us all. Here's a startling statistic. One out of one people will die. One out of, that's everybody. She's like, wait a second, one out of, no, wait. Yes, everybody will die. One out of one people will die. But of all the fears that plague us as humans, there's none greater than the fear of death. We do. We fear it. We're concerned about it. And maybe not so much like what happens to us to the, in the afterlife, but by what means am I going to die? Like, that's a scary proposition. Can I tell you a scary story? Something happened to me last night. I'm out deer hunting last night. And um, I'm trying to be very non-graphic, but I got an animal, and I'm tracking it down, and as I'm tracking it down, I'm following, it's called a blood trail, no lie, like I'm not even exaggerating, a black bear comes running out of the woods towards me after the same deer, 20 yards away from me, and all I have is my bow, like I'm not... Like, you can't have anything else. I'm literally like, <laughs> I'm in grass, like seven foot tall grass. I'm out of here. I'm sorry. I'm out. You can have it. I will go back out today with my tractor and try to find it. But there is this fear in death. Death is a fundamental, a fundamentally human problem. Human problem, right? Here's some stats. Worldwide, there are approximately 56,600,000 deaths each year. That works out to 4.7 million deaths a month, 155,000 per day, 6,500 per hour, 107 per minute, 1.8 deaths per second. It was said by a Greek playwriter, of all the great wonders, none is greater than man, for only death can he find no cure. And I mean, isn't that so true? Like, we have people who are frozen today, waiting for a day that we figure out how to cure their problem and let them live forever. If you are a believer in Jesus, then we can, that we can be encouraged of an afterlife, we can be encouraged of a blessed hope of eternal life with Jesus. But what about those who do not believe in Christ? We're going to look at both sides of this today. First, I want to start with a hope. Not that we need to be excited about death, but there can be a joy knowing that one day, we will be reunited with Christ as believers. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.8 that he would rather be absent from his body and 
be present with the Lord. He continues this thought in Philippians 1.23 where he says, My desire is to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. Which is far better. So here's a good hope that I have for you. Earth, this life, is the only hell a Christian will ever know. But here's the sad opposite of that. Earth is the only heaven an unbeliever will ever know. Death is the final hurdle to be sanctified and set apart with God. But there's two types of death that the Bible talks about. I want to take some time and talk about both, but this entire sermon is going to be dedicated to one type of death, okay? So the first type of death in the Bible is physical death. And what I'm trying to teach you here at Family Church is what we believe here, okay? Now, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to have the same doctrinal viewpoints. Um, you don't have to be spirit-filled to go to a spirit-filled church. Like, you get what I'm saying? We're talking about theological and doctrinal differences. But we sat down and we made up some in-house definitions so that we could all kind of agree as a staff what we believe. And here's what we define physical death as. Physical death is separate, the separation of the spirit and the soul from the body. Okay, we get that? The body will go to the grave and the spirit and the soul will go somewhere else. We'll talk about that later. The Bible also talks about a spiritual death. What, you're either alive unto God or you're not alive unto God. It would be a spiritual death. And we define spiritual death as being a separation of the human spirit and soul from God. Separation of the human spirit and soul from God. And we know that that did happen, and it does happen. We are not certain today at what age that happens. We here believe at Family Church that a child, uh, a baby, is born into an age of innocence, that they do not know the difference between right and wrong, therefore they are not accountable for right or wrong. So if a child were to lose its life, it is in heaven, it is with the Lord. But there is, a, there is an age where our kids start to know that they're doing something wrong, right? Have you ever seen your kid, uh, eventually at some point now they're like looking around before they do something, like they know what they're doing is wrong. And I will admit that that age has gotten younger and younger and younger over these last few years. Right? It has. We don't know what age it is, but at some point, a child who is alive unto God will have to make a choice for themselves to follow God. And that's on us, parents. That's on us to train up a child in the way they should go so that when they're old, they'll not depart. To instill our beliefs into our kids. Today, I want to focus on physical death because I think that's where the most questions are. I think we have a lot of questions, especially since the pandemic. We've experienced a lot more death around us in the last five years than we have in our entire lives. So let's look at first, why do we die? Why don't humans live forever? Science tells us that the human body reproduces itself every seven years, right? Hair falls out, hair grows back. Cut your skin, it grows back, right? It heals itself. How come we don't live forever? Genesis 2.16. And the Lord God commanded man, or Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of one tree. You can have everything else, but one tree is mine. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Yes? As the Bible says, I'm not making that up. But guess what didn't happen? They didn't die. I mean, you guys read the rest of the story, right? They live on, they have kids, they get run out of the garden, they, they populate the earth. They didn't die. The Bible says that if you eat it, you will surely die. Okay, so let's, let's, let's break this down. First, they did die 
spiritually. There's now a separation between them and God. So much so, like we see it played out, they're hiding from God. And God says, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I'm hiding. He says, why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? This whole scene, right? And like God's up here and he's looking down here. He can see right where Adam is. What's he doing? He's restoring communication. He's restoring that communication. Come out. Don't hide from me. But there is a consequence, Adam. You disobeyed. You sinned. You fell short. There is a consequence. You got to get out of the garden. And he didn't have to get out of the garden because God was mad. God was like, you idiot. You stupid jerk. I told you. That's not what happened. God said this. He said, listen, we got to do something. We got to fix this. If Adam and Eve eat of the tree of life, now that they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they will live forever in a fallen state. We got to protect them. And God running them out in a fury or in a hurry was his protection on all of us. So literally, death is God's mercy on humanity. That we will not live forever in a fallen state. Ain't trying to brainwash, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. But they didn't die then. But they started dying. They started the aging process. Get that? The day they ate of it, they started aging. The day they ate of it, they started to die. I heard a scientist or a health teacher once say, we live for 30 years and we die for 30 years. (laughs) That's scary. Take your vitamins. Come on, man. Got to eat good. We, we literally kill ourselves. And we're like, we're, we're actually speeding up this process by the decisions that we make. Listen, so another death did happen that day. God had to kill an animal. He killed an animal and clothed them with the skin of that animal. And that blood covered their sin, but it didn't make them right with God. It was but a covering. It's like whiteout over, I mean, I, half of you don't even know what whiteout is. <laughs> so back in the 1900s, <laughs> there was these things called typewriters. They didn't have a screen. <laughs> and if you messed up, you had to put whiteout over it and type over it again. Today, we don't even... We've seen typewriters in museums or at great-grandma's house. Today we hit a delete button and it's wiped out. It's gone. It's forgotten, right? And and, and you know what I love about God? There's no undo button. There's no undo to your your delete. It's gone. So anyway, don't get me started on that. This covering of their sin didn't make them right with God. There was still a separation. I'm working on a series called Seasons and Reasons, How God Dealt with Humanity Over the Seasons of Time. It'll talk about dispensations. But they went from the dispensations of innocence to a dispensation of consciousness. That they were ruled by their conscience. It told them what was right and what was wrong. But I want to look at, I want to look at what happens to a non-Christian when they die. Okay? And I'm not, telling you this to scare you, but it's scary. It is scary, okay? And I'm telling it to you not to scare you, but to encourage you, let's do something about this. Let's do something about this while we can, all right? Most popular verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. We know it, for God so loved the world. His only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So anyone who believes in him, It's not going to perish. Perish means full separation from God. It means that they're going to have eternal life. It doesn't mean you're going to live forever in this body, but your spirit and your soul is alive unto God. It will live forever. Most Christians stop right there. Because the next verse is too good to be true. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. 
So if you're walking around feeling condemnation, if you're walking around feeling condemned, that's not, what, that's not God. That's not God. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That's good news. But guess what? The church stops there. We don't read the next verse. And the next verse is scary. The next verse is spooky. Okay? It means we need to do something about this. Ready? John 3, 18. Whoever believes in God, in Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because of their evil works. Okay, now let's talk about this today. In society today, if someone accuses me of wrongdoing and I go to court, I am innocent until... Or it's supposed to be. This says that if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're already guilty. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You're already guilty. And therefore, what is the consequence? Hell. Hell. To be absent from the body for a non-believer is eternal separation from God. You are already, you are already condemned. This is, this is the judgment. There's already a judgment made. That the people of the world, away, apart from God, loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Now that's heavy. That's scary. That's scary. And listen, I don't want to get up and preach that. I don't want to get up and scare people like that and tell them, hey, listen, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, because that's not what Jesus did. Jesus got up and said, yo, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to me. Follow me. If you're heavy burdened and laden, I will give you rest. Like, he led by love. He didn't lead by fear. But this is scary. I don't want to be eternally separated from God. I don't want to go into a place of hell. But this says that they are condemned already. And Pastor Mike, why are you sharing this with us? Because I want you to be evangelists. I want you to love your neighbor enough to not watch them go to a place like this. Luke 16, 19, Jesus is telling a story. It is a parable, but it's a strange parable. And I'm going I'm to tell you why as we read it. Here's a parable. It says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who had feasted sumptuously every day, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. Now, parables never have people's names. This is actually the only parable that has a man named. So we're really uncertain, is this a literal story or a parable? Is this a made-up story or did this actually happen? We don't know. He's covered with sores. He desired, desired to be fed from what fell from his master's table. Moreover, even dogs came and licked his sores. I don't know why that's in there, but that's nasty. <laughs> the poor man died. Now I want to tell you this. I've been in the room. I've been in the room with many people when they've passed. I've been in the room when Christians have passed, and I've been in the room when non-Christians have passed. And I'll tell you, when a Christian passed, it's like, it's like peaceful. It's, it's almost like warm and comforting. I've also been in the room when non-Christians have passed, and it's like, Ooh, almost like cold and like, there's like a yucky feeling. And you don't have to be super spiritual to feel it. It's just there, okay? Now watch. When the poor man died, and I, I don't know if this is why. When the poor man died, he was carried by angels to Abraham's side. This would be a place called Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell, or in Hades, being in torment. 
no, this is some scary stuff, man. This dude went to hell and is being tormented. The rich man lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off. And he calls to Abraham and it's like, hey, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and come feed me. And come quench my thirst. And it's kind of strange if you study this out. This rich man, he's still so pious that he won't even talk to Lazarus. He's only talking to Abraham. He won't even talk to him, right? Because Lazarus is a poor man. And he says, Abraham, tell Lazarus to come. Tell him what? Dude, you're guilty. You're in prison. You got no rights. Lazarus is free. Watch this. Luke 16, 30. And he says no to him. And so he says, Abraham, but if someone goes to my friends and tell them what happened here, not to come here, they will believe and they will repent. And Abraham says back to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. If your friends and family won't believe you, if they won't believe the gospel message now, someone rising from the dead, and and isn't this funny that Jesus rose from the dead, and many don't believe, and we don't believe today, a lot of us? That ain't enough. It ain't enough simply someone raising from the dead. We must believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I'm going to, listen, that's scary. That is. So now let's talk about our hope as a Christian, as a believer. Well, if those who do not believe are condemned already because there's a judgment, then there's also a judgment on the Christian. And that judgment says sanctified, set apart, redeemed, paid for. So for the the Christian, when they leave their body, they will be in eternity with God. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. This word asleep here has created all sorts of theological beliefs, whether you just fall asleep or or it's talking about death. It, it, It uses the word asleep. That you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. So... The Bible tells us that there, we're going to grieve, but we shouldn't grieve the same way. We shouldn't grieve as someone who has no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So Christ is going to bring those who have already died. For this we declare to you by word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So let's just say that you live all the way until the time of the rapture, the trumpet sounds. Those who are dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the clouds. Now watch how he closes this out. He says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And I think this is why we still grieve with no hope. is because we don't want to talk about this stuff. Because it's weird. It's weird. What do, you, what do you mean you're looking forward to being with God one day and not here like, life is so good. It is. Life is so good. Life is so good. But death is also a natural part of the living process. Someone's going to die and life is still going to go on for everybody else. And we have to know how to deal with that and how to have a hope and how to comfort others with those words. Because the souls of Christians who have gone on are eternally happy in the presence of God, there is no need for us as Christians to pray for those who are already dead. This is a Roman Catholic belief. Uh, We have a different view on that. They believe that when Christians die, you go to a place of purgatory. And that our prayers can help them get out of purgatory and possibly make it into heaven and I just want to give you the urgency of the matter. The urgency of the matter is this. When you step out of this body, there's no second chance. That's the urgency. I'm not saying this to scare you. 
I'm saying this to inspire you. Don't let a loved one go the wrong way. <laughs> Give them hope. Speak life. I mean, we can come into a room, God is good, so good, good God, so good, so good. So then tell people that he is so good. Live your life as if he's so good. Be an example in a way because he's so good. I could not possibly and cannot possibly address all of the areas of death, of, of the things that we would have questions about, physical or spiritual death. And that really wasn't my point today. My point today was to bring an urgency, an urgency. I've seen too many people, how do I say this? I want to say this the right way. I've seen very few people die well. Can I say it like that? I've seen Christians tormented by the fear of death that they hold on so long because they're just not sure what's going to happen. Man, that's... that's that's not a good God. That's not a good religion. That's not a good faith. Now listen, it's in all of us to live long. The Bible tells us, with long life will I um, give thee. I will satisfy you with long life. A strong spirit will sustain you bodily, but a wounded spirit who can bear? The Bible talks about these things. If you be willing and obedient... You shall eat the good of the land, and that's encouraging the type of life that you're going to live. My heart today is to create an urgency within you for the lost and to give hope and peace and rest to those among us whose family members have died in Christ. I hope you know and understand that God doesn't take anybody. He receives them with open arms. That, there, there's a difference. There's a difference. Now, I could get very angry at a God who took a loved one from me prematurely. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't take life. He gives life and he receives life. If you've ever been wounded by a church, by the thoughts of an angry God or a God that needed a flower in his garden so he plucked your loved one. It's such bull. It's such bull. Like I'm so sorry that you were taught that. God don't need another flower. And God don't need you in heaven. Like he don't need you. But he loves you. And he receives you. And when your body wears out from the decay of this world, and you step out of that body into eternity, he receives you with open arms. Now, I don't want to mislead you, and I want to get nerdy for like two seconds. You like my new runway? <laughs> this, this is for Christmas. This is for Christmas. I'm going to get nerdy for two seconds, and I, and I don't want to confuse you. But here's what we don't know. We don't know that when you die, you immediately go to heaven. We don't know that. But here's what we do know. To step out of this body, to, to leave this body, leave life, we go into something called eternity. Inside of eternity, there's no time. Time, and this will mess you up. I, mean, I can get lost in hours of thought. Time is only for the living. When God created the earth, he said, let there be light. And then he broke the light into day and night. He created time. And that's only for the living. So that we can account for time. We know how many days there are, how many years there are, how old we are. That's only for the living. When you leave your body, you step into eternity. There is no time. It's not, there's no year or day or week or month. It's just eternity outside of time. So whether you were asleep for a second or asleep for 10,000 years, 
There's no time, it's instantaneous. Okay, I'm gonna break it down like this. Has anybody ever had surgery and you went under anesthesia? And they say, count down from a hundred. Like, I don't even know why they say count down from a hundred. Like, count down from three. <laughs> yeah, three. That anesthesia kicks in, it's lights out. And then all of a sudden you wake up in recovery. And you're like, how long was I out? It was a 10 hour surgery. No way. There was no time. Because time is only relevant to the, those who are alive. You get what I'm saying? Instantaneously. Absent from the body, you're in eternity. It's instantaneous. Whether it was a minute of our time or 10,000 years of our living time, it's instantaneous. You are in that next place. All right, I hope that didn't confuse you. I hope you get that. But there's that urgency in us. How do I ensure that my loved ones believe this faith, that they believe in this hope, that they have eternal life? And I'm going to leave you hanging there. I'm not going to do a salvation call today. I'm not going to offer a prayer. Because if you came today and something that I said was like, man, I'm just really not sure about my eternity. I'm really not sure where I would go. I'm really not sure what I believe. You owe it to yourself to investigate. You owe it to yourself to talk to somebody. You owe it to yourself to talk to somebody on your row or come up and see a care team member or see one of our staff pastors to pursue this. It's easy for me to do a prayer and someone says, ah, yeah, I prayed that today. And then we assume that you had some sort of faith to change your life. I want you, man, I've seen people die so bad. Christians for 30 years and they're on their deathbed and they're like, I don't know if I was good enough for God. Bull! God doesn't want you living that way. God mighty, like that, oh, I could cuss. It makes me so angry. That is not a good religion. That's not a good faith. That's not a good hope. When your body begins to break down, you should be able to say, I have run the race. I have finished the course. I have fought the good fight. I got no more to fight for. I have conquered this life. I have accomplished what I was set here to do. And you step out, fall asleep, and wake up in eternity. I ain't trying to brainwash you. I truly want to give you a hope. I want to give you a hope. I have a hope that I'm going to see some loved ones, man. Our heart yearns for that loss, that missing component of our lives. And I got this hope, I'm going to see him again. And I hope you do too. And I hope that you talk to somebody and find somebody. I'm leaving you hanging today. Next week we're going to talk about what the church is. And I have some exciting news that I want to share with you. You do not want to miss next week. Some brand new programs that we're going to be launching in 2023. You do not want to miss it. Father, I thank you today. That this word we shared will not return void. Lord, I pray that no one leaves here afraid. That no one has any bad dreams. But Lord, there's a hope. There's an urgency to the calling to which you've called us and created us for. Help us to embrace the reality of life and the reality of death. Help us to put our trust in you and our hope in you. As we leave here today, Lord, I believe that we are blessed. We're blessed coming in. We're blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love ya. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.